Thanks for joining. This is an AMA, it stands for Ask Me Anything. And I especially appreciate hard questions on things that are not going well, culture, pay, team composition, things like that. Clement, thanks for starting us off, Clement. How did I get connected with our my current mentor? Um, so there's there's a couple of people that I um, that I learned from. We have um, our investors, uh, especially Bruce and Philly, the A and B round investors, um, because they work at a venture capital firm and they have a board seat. They 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 spend a lot of time with us. Um, then um, then there's advisors advisors to the companies. So that's uh, Luke Keynes, uh, ex-CEO of, uh, of Puppet. There's uh, Zach Holman, a prolific programmer. And, um, and there's a third one, Zach Erlocker, an ex-COO of um, Zendesk and Duo Security. But the, probably the most important one is my CEO, EO coach. His name is John Ham, and um, he got introduced to me, I think, through Bruce. Um, and he's been a CEO himself. Jim asks, what are you most excited for for the year, either personal or business? Um, well, the personal thing already happened. We moved, we moved uh, to a better place. So I'm excited about that. Um, we just had a housewarming party for uh, people living in the Bay Area uh, yesterday evening. So that was fun. Um, but business-wise, I'm really excited about completing our vision of, of, of um, not just making a tool for developers, but also making, making something for uh, dev and ops. Um, let me share my screen. If you look, uh, if you look here, all the ones in bold are things we're adding to GitLab this year. Now, kind of, I think we're on track. We kind of have added uh, about half of these, slightly less, but the, the year is, is not, not half as well. And I think it's so, um, we, we kind of stumbled uh, across a secret. And it's a secret, not in the sense that we don't tell anyone, but it's a secret in the sense that people won't believe us. And the secret is that it's so much better to have a single application for all the uh, steps in the DevOps lifecycle, from all the way from managing to monitoring and securing. Um, we didn't believe it. Like um, Camille had to first convinced Dimitri that it was better to integrate GitLab CI with GitLab. And then they had to convince me and we both kind of reluctantly agreed. And then it turned out that it's a lot better to have your CI integrated. And we thought we could get all the benefits with just a really great API integration. But it turns out like if it's a single application, you're able to work from one interface, you're able to message back and forth. You don't have to like pass credentials around. You don't need another login or you don't hey you don't need another session to set up it's just better and uh, i think that's that's one of the um that, that's our secret and uh, that's that's what makes gitlab unique and and now being able to do that across uh, more parts of the life cycle is uh, is really amazing and we've we've tried to kind of write down a couple of of like what are the, the emergent benefits of a single application? And there's there's probably a hundred, but um, but there's a there's a lot of things that just become easier. Post the link in the in the chat. So that's what I'm 
very excited about. Um, then of course, I'm also excited about kind of where the, where the business is going. Um, Matt is visiting San Francisco from Colorado and he was at housewarming yesterday and him, me and Michael McBride were talking and it's, we're going kind of from a feature cell to now we were talking to a, a he visited a potential customer and he's like, well, you could, yes, you, they were interested in GitLab almost to save money, but now uh, the discussion is going about, okay, well, how important is security to you? How important is it to speed up your DevOps cycle time? And for them, they're now, it takes about six weeks for them to release something. If they can cut that down to two weeks, it would mean a kind of a major improvement to their business. So they'd be able to launch much faster, get new ideas out faster, get things tested faster, and they could kind of outmaneuver the competition. So I think us, instead of selling, hey, we're, we're GitLab, we're selling version control, we're now moving to, hey, we're GitLab, we, we're selling uh, complete DevOps. We're now moving into, hey, we're GitLab, we're selling concurrent DevOps, we're selling you a 200% faster DevOps cycle. And that's interesting because suddenly you are solving a business problem. Like what more, like if you tell executives like, hey, you now have to wait six weeks for something to get done, it could be reduced to two weeks. How would that, what, what would that do for your business? And most of the time the answer is a resounding, wow, that would be awesome. We'd, we'd be able to generate more revenue that way. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about kind of having that conversation uh, more uh, because I, I think we'd be helping customers more and, and we'd be able to generate more revenue for ourselves too. So Clement asks about a compensation discussion. Um, yeah, I haven't followed the whole discussion. I see, I can, I understand what's in the description. I've seen the issue, but I haven't read the whole thread. I think in, in general, um, there's all kinds of ways to kind of improve, improve kind of the, 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 um, our ability to attract and retain great people. And we have to do what's most efficient. So our efficiency is one of our values. So we have to kind of balance the different things. And right, right now, I think, two things we can do uh, to increase efficiency is to reach out more. Um, I know most of the people that are per currently in the company probably opted in to GitLab like they, 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 you found GitLab instead of GitLab finding you. I think in, in general, um, and, that's, and that's, that's awesome, but I think in general, like for example, when we do an executive search, it's, it's with executive searches, it's like not possible to, um, to say, hey, we're open, we're hiring for this, that, or uh, that. Um, what you do is you go out and you find the best people and you have, you, you approach them. And I think we'll always have a mix of kind of people that really like want to work here and that found us, but you got to recognize that most people are not aware of GitLab. So we're missing out on a whole bunch of candidates that don't know about us. So actively going after uh, people, uh, I think is really interesting. We got a great story to tell. We're a very interesting company to work for. And I think we should, we should uh, tell that story more often. Uh, just like we, uh, we don't just rely on inbound sales. We, we have SDRs that reach out. I think for, for attracting the best people, we should also reach out. And we'll have the people like most of you that joined that found us and that really are interested and, and that joined and that should always be a, a healthy mix. And actually, I think we should also probably um, work more on employer branding. Uh, but I also think we should reach out more. Um, so, and I think that's, that's a very cost efficient way to, uh, to do it. Um, Andreas asks, how did we come up with the name GitLab? Um, Mitri came up with it, he named it and he created the project a year before I even know it existed. Um, and I think, uh, 
there's a common ancestor in Git web. So Git, the program used to call, or still comes with something called Git web, which was a quick way to browse repositories. You could set that up on a local server. And you can say that probably GitHub took inspiration from Git web and then we, we took inspiration from, from Git web and GitHub probably to come up with GitLab. David asks where I want to travel to. Um, yeah, I, I think very high on the list are uh, Japan in general, not a specific place, although I'd love to see Tokyo. Um, and I'd love to go to Japan because it's a very kind of advanced civilization and culture, but very different from, uh, from ours. And for example, the street naming, like we refer to things by, by street and, and number and they refer to, uh, to locations by the building. Like it both makes sense. It's just the opposite of what we did. And I, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and the other one would be uh, Moscow. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to go or my, my, my wife, Karen, just really wants to go there, especially see the beautiful subway stations there. I think maybe the inverse of the subway stations in San Francisco. I live near Civic Center. And if you want to Google Civic Center BART, then uh, on YouTube, you'll, you'll find out what I mean. Philippe, if you could go back in time and change one thing in GitLab, what would it be? Um, I'd get uh, uh, more serious about GitLab.com sooner. Um, now, how soon? I'm not sure because like you have limited resources. So was it 2015, 2016, 2017? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do think right now that we shouldn't, yeah, we're, we're not where we should be. Now, I'm, I'm very proud of the, the team and we're making great progress. I just was in the GCP migration call and uh, it looks, uh, we, we made like 25% progress towards the, the migration. So with very kind of being way understaffed, so I'm very proud of the team and it, I, I like the progression now, but uh, it's, the. The progression is nice, but where we are is not where we should have been in this part of our life cycle. So uh, from an investment perspective, hiring and people, it was too little too late. Uh, Kim says, Summit 2019 in Japan. Uh, Kim, uh, in Tokyo, I think an apple costs like 10 bucks or something. Like it's, it's, it's not outrageous, but it's, it's a very expensive uh, country. Joe asks, how, much, how many hours do you sleep each night? Um, try to sleep eight hours, uh, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but that's about, uh, we're getting, we're, we're kind of getting that much sleep. We go to bed around 10 o'clock, uh, probably sleeping by, by 10.30 and then wake up at 6.30. And then within 10 minutes, we're at the elevator going down to the, to the gym. I've, I've went to the gym every single day day since we moved here. So I'm on a streak. <laughs> Clement says, I noticed we changed the handbook to set a target date for the IPO. Um, yes, that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting one. I think it's 16, Wednesday, six, November 16, 2020. Um, the fact that we made it more specific doesn't imply that it's more likely. Um, I think what we're, what we're saying is we're gonna strive towards that and then we can decide at any point to kind of delay it. And that might be like most companies end up delaying it because it's, there's, there's lots of downsides and upsides to it. Um, if you wanna get an idea about that, there's a document called IPO 2020 pros and cons. Let me uh, make sure I message to everyone. There you go. Um, and there's the pros and cons. So we're not sure whether we, we do it. However, 
we're sure that we're going to drive towards it. So we're probably going to start kind of the, 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 the legal process, but like the preparations for this in the fourth quarter um, of this year, because you kind of need two years to prep and it's going to be about a million dollars to do all the things. We could start a year later and have a year to prep, but then it gets twice as expensive. So now you need $2 million. So it's the earlier you take a, deci take a decision, like we might do it, uh, the, the, e the kind of the more time you have, the easier it is and, and uh, the more affordable it is and the less stressful. So considering that we're going to, uh, we're striving for it, um, what would be the earliest time to get out? Uh, it would be when you have a million, a hundred million dollars in recognized revenue. So that's not the same as ARR. That is kind of ARR is like your, your run rate or even the recurring revenue, but you kind of, it's like past revenue that you recognize. So for example, when we make a, a sell, like we say, hey, it's an incremental ACV of like, say, suppose we sell a subscription for a million dollars. It's a million dollars incremental ACV, but we recognize that over the course of the year as like a 12th every month. And we need like that recognized part, we need a hundred million of that. And Paul did the stats and came like, we could probably go out uh, fourth quarter of 2020. And um, yeah, so it's kind of late and then you wanna be before Thanksgiving. So this was kind of the date. And I've, I've learned with, um, with setting a date of 2020, it made all our kind of, uh, kind of company and leadership decisions kind of easier. You say like, oh, 2020, you wanna be here. You can plan back from that. And I found that planning back is a lot easier than planning forward. Because planning forward, you don't know what, whether the curve is gonna be like this or this. So then you're debating the whole time. If you know you gotta go here, it's much easier. So planning is much easier if you know where you wanna go. So we'll keep it. We now have a specific date in the year and it makes planning for the executive team really easy. And at any point we can decide, okay, well, we might be ready to IPO, but we're not gonna do it. Um, so that's, uh, that's the current thinking. Oh, the, how the date was decided? Yeah, so as late as possible in Q4, um, but before Thanksgiving. <laughs> what are my favorite snacks? Wow, that's, a, that's nice out of the left field. Um, so I drink a lot of Soylent because it's uh, kind of delicious. It's like tastes like chocolate milk which is amazing and it's kind of healthy and I don't have to spend a lot of time prepping food. However, reminds me for, um, um, for lunch now, I, Karen purchased a couple of gobble um, soups. So I'm gonna try a soup today for the first time in a quarter or something. Um, and Gobble is this amazing service. I know there's a thousand meal services, but Gobble's really, really legit. And I eat better at home than at fancy restaurants. It's, it's amazing. Um, so looking forward to that. And then I ha don't have any other snacks in the house because if they are there, I eat them. And we have a problem because there was a housewarming yesterday. So I think there's lots of stuff left. It's kind of healthy, so, but I, I think I'll, I'll start nibbling on that. But very frequently I walk through the kitchen and I open all the cabinets, even though I already know there's nothing there. So I'm really glad I don't live in an office that has like M&Ms or something because I'd be gaining weight like crazy. Thanks and um, feel free to ask uh, for me to elaborate on any of the other questions if you kind of have specific suggestions. For example, on the, uh, uh, the people ops 111 issue or things like that. Clement asks, how's the search for the CMO? Um, yeah, it's going well. Uh, we kicked it off. We uh, hired a recruiter, Steve from 343. Uh, 
and I really like how they're approaching it. It's been, it was kind of the best kickoff call we, uh, we ever had based, uh, based it here. So I'm excited, uh, but the, the bar is super high. So it's gonna, it's gonna take uh, probably months to, uh, to find the right person. So yeah, personality traits. Thanks, uh, Suri. That's a great question. Let me let me find uh, let me find some relevant materials. So this uh, this is like the uh, the the experience and the characteristics we're looking for. I assume you can read faster than I can uh, tell you about it. So I'll leave leave it for that. Yeah, Clement asked a story like, what have we learned so far about uh, CMOs uh, and, and what are we looking for in the next uh, person? Um, I think one of the things that I'll be, um, two things I'll be watching closely, um, kind of planning back from a target. So in reference to the IPO, I uh, already said like it's much easier to kind of know where you want to go and plan towards that, then knowing where you are and then guessing kind of what direction you have to go. And I see uh, we need someone that does that, takes where we need to go and plans back from that and knows the implications for that, for like what they got to do today, this week, this month, and where they need the, the organization to go. And you need that because we're, we're tripling every year and marketing kind of need to grow even faster than that, that's, that's quite a pace. Um, and uh, if you're not diligent about your, how fast you have to grow, then, then you end up behind. Another thing I'd really love to see is a very strong uh, kind of data and ROI driven decisions. Um, in, um, in marketing, basically where we want to end up is that we look at LTV versus CAC per channel and then do investments based on that. Um, let me try to unpack that. So LTV is lifetime value. So with that, you look at not just what you, the incremental ACV you get from a customer in the initial deal, but you look at like, how long are they going to be a customer? How much net retention is there going to be? How much extra are they going to spend with us? Either because they could move to a higher tier or they add more users. And then the CAC is cost, customer acquisition costs. So how much did it cost us to acquire? So you could imagine um, you spend a hundred thousand bucks to acquire two customers. Um, and both of them spent to have an initial order of $200,000. Great. Like your, uh, LTV CAC ratio is two. Like you, you spend half to acquire them, what you, what you get in the first year. Where you want to get to um, is know how much they're going to be over time. If one of those customers you sold like to every user in that company uh, and at their highest tier, and the other one is a much bigger company where you just have an initial entrance, but there's so much room for expansion and that expansion actually probably will happen. That is a much better investment. Um, now you want to attribute that to the different channels and campaigns uh, you're running. So know what is working. Is it, is it content marketing that brought them in? Is it, um, is it the outbound marketing that brought them in? Is it the analyst relations that brought them in? That's super hard to figure out. Um, but it's very worthwhile because if you know what brought someone in, you can uh, adequately kind of load those costs. And you can see, oh, we're gonna invest more here and less here or vice versa. <laughs> A 
Dan, I love it. Um, the, Dan says, look, we, we tell customers they can release more often. Do we have a time frame for releasing more frequently on goodlab.com? Um, it's improving, Dan. Uh, so it used to be that we did no release candidates. That's a long time ago. Then we did a few release candidates. I think the trend is more and more release candidates. And we'll keep upping that uh, to not just release candidates, but just making sure every single feature that gets merged into a master gets uh, released separately. Now, uh, right now we're still using our omnibus packages to release and we kind of have to build a new package for every single thing we do. Um, we wanna move off of that and towards uh, cloud native charts where we're using Kubernetes and it's much easier to do deployments, much easier to do canaries where you only send a certain part of your traffic uh, to the new release. Uh, so we need better tooling and, and we're working on that. But we're not, as said before, with GitLab.com, we're not where we need to be. But the, the team is making progress towards that. 